Okay, I placed another very big order from Bugs in Cyberspace because Peter had a lot of stuff of interest in stock. So I normally unpack everything and then show it to you before I put it away, but I thought I'd do something different and show you everything now. It's been 24 hours. I got such a big variety that th this time that... I thought this way, you know, I can show you a little bit how I keep everything, their cages, talk about it a little bit, um, so that you can kind of see the way that I do things in case you are interested um, in some of these bugs um, from the website. So um, we're going to start here because this guy is out. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see him. This is a glorious scarab beetle larva or grub. And this is just the same kind of mix that I use for my millipedes. It's peat, um, hardwood litter, leaf litter, hardwood rotting wood, and then I always give like little carrot pieces and stuff for him to eat. I've raised one of these before. They also, um, Peter on his website says they also really, really like uh, grass clippings and stuff like that if you have a source of organic grass clippings and then down here I don't know if he's out you might be able to see the little black speck under that leaf there on top of the the piece of bark the log this is a bold jumping spider uh, Phil Philippa audax or something like that and very tiny, they're very tiny insects. This appears to be an adult male, and you can kind of see there on the ground that little shriveled up thing it was his first meal that I gave him. And that red runner roach is almost the size of him, and he ate it, no problem. Um, jumping spiders have no problems like taking down anything the size of themselves. They'll jump on it and death roll it like a crocodile. It's just so fun to watch. I absolutely love jumping spiders. This is a half gallon sized cookie, plastic cookie jar from Walmart. Um, I just have venting on the lid. I really should put a little bit on the sides. Um, they do seem to do better with um, better ventilation. I keep my larger species and my females in the half gallon sized critter keepers, which have the fully vented plastic lid. So I'm going to add a few more holes along this upper rim here on the side, but you can see for you tarantula keepers, um, that this is very, very big compared to what you'd keep a tarantula sling of this size. And that is because jumping spiders are very active. As their name suggests, they like to jump around. If they do not have the space to jump around, they, um, tend to suffer, uh, muscle weakness and their muscles uh, degrade and they will actually die if you keep them anything too small. So I would say this is the minimum size. A half gallon critter keeper or cookie jar is the absolute minimum size that I would keep most jumping spiders in. The absolute smallest kind of jumping spiders, like the zebra jumping spiders, which are like half the size of this guy, you could go in like half a size smaller than this, but for most of the species, you're going to find your regal jumpers, bull jumpers, your red back jumpers, um, even the brown jumpers, which are about the size of a little bit, just a tad smaller than this guy. I would say you want a half gallon um, size cage or bigger. And you can see I have a little bit of uh, decor in here, but not a lot. You want plenty of open space for them to actually be able to jump from, you know, twig to twig, leaf to leaf, wall to wall. If it's too cluttered, they don't have enough room to um, jump around. And they make like little hammock kind of webs underneath um, leaves or pieces of bark. In this case, he's got a little, little tunnel kind of out of webbing underneath that leaf. So I always have something kind of for that. Um, this here, they're kind of hiding somewhere. This is my death feigning or desert beetle habitat. Every single beetle in here has come from Peter at Bugs in Cyberspace. Right here is one of my new ones along the edge here. I'll try to get her out. 
You can see why they're called death fainting beetles. <laughs> they will like stiffen up and fall over and play dead. This is a smooth death fainting beetle, it appears female just based on size. Um, and I've, like I said, I've kept all of these kind of things before, but every single one in here is from Peter. So I got the smooth death fainting beetle because my last one died just of age. And then I did get another blue. So I have two blues and the new, the new blue seems to be hiding because I think that's my male over there. I do also have a diabolical ironclad beetle in here somewhere, but she's a lot more shy than the death veinings. Um, again, all from Peter. And this is just how I set them up. I used to use sand. I've used a sand before. This is like a fine chipped aspen. It's T-Rex lizard litter, it's called. And I have also used um, Equal Earth, the, the coconut uh, choir or husk, whatever, as well. And this is just some fake succulents. They're not real. These guys will eat anything. You can see I have a little piece of carrot. I feed them um, little leftover bits from roaches, crickets, freeze-dried crickets. Um, if I cut the heads off the mealworms for some of my slings or something, I give the heads to these guys to eat. Um, they absolutely love, and you can see there's actually a little piece back there, that little brown thing. Um, cat kibble like dry pieces of cat food and even though the pieces are food the little pieces of kibble are about the size of the beetles they can pick them up in their mouth and will walk around the tank with it in their mouth like their dog with a bone i absolutely love it they do like to climb but they're very clumsy at it uh, which is why the tank is very low it's very squat but there's plenty of things for them to climb on this is some um plastic canvas they can climb on they can climb on top of here this is a piece of cactus wood and they'll climb on all of it um but they're very clumsy they're a lot of fun to watch they're usually out they're usually active um my niece loves watching them play dead so that's that then i have two praying mantids here you can see this one this is the bigger of the two it'll you can kind of see her i'll try to move her into some better lighting there you go you can kind of see her a little bit better um this is a jeweled flower mantis i believe they also go by asian flower mantis i think it's the same uh species i'd have to double check the scientific name um this i believe just guessing by looking at it is an l4 um l4 l5 so just another molt or two it is going to be a full-grown adult but I'm so happy I have this species. I've wanted it a while. Uh, this thing she's standing on is just a little strip of plastic canvas that I just have standing up in there using the sides um, and all that. It's just being held up by gravity. And this is, I found is really easy for the mantids to, to hook their um, like little hooks that are on the end of their feet into for molting. And ever since I started using the plastic canvas bridges like this, I have had a, a lot less cases of mantids falling during a molt. And they tend to hook their, their feet in there so good that I cannot get the molted skin out usually without breaking the legs off. So it's that good. This is a typical 32 ounce container. There's paper on the inside there so she could molt from that as well. And the plant is just kind of for kind of helps hold the plastic canvas so it doesn't fall over when I move her her cup so she still needs a name and then here is another mantis this one is a lot smaller so you're probably not really going to see him but that little brown thing up there at the top of the leaf there you go it's kind of zoomed in this is a l2 I believe it is um what the listing said giant shield mantis they're my absolute favorite species of the giant mantids and he's not shy at all like he came right out of his cup wanted to climb on me every time i take the lid off he wants to come out explore climb on me uh the flower mantis is a lot more um apprehensive about everything so these guys just the other one i had too was very friendly like that and this does appear to be a male 
and I've noticed pretty much all my male mantids have been a lot just less worried and scared of me and again you can see this is a pretty basic setup very similar to the flower mantis with the plastic egg crate it's a shorter piece because it's a smaller mantis right now it's just what I had um, and I do want to note the plants if you use any kind of plants or flowers with mantids always always use silk they cannot grip well enough to plastic and there's a high chance that they're gonna slip and fall while molting and die the um, silk plants have a lot more texture they can grip to it a lot better so always use silk again that's a 32 ounce container paper underneath the lid um, it's not out but I did also buy a bumblebee mantis which I popped in here you can kind of see the butt and one of my smoky oak mantids that also live in this cage I usually have Florida ivories this is a clear view brand habitat in the medium size I believe um, and you can see I added additional vent cross ventilation on the sides in addition to what naturally comes on the lid there around the edges just a couple branches and it's the same mix as I use for the beetle it's a uh, peat the hardwood litter the rotting wood um, there is some sand in here you can see dotted throughout for drainage so that when I missed it the water doesn't pool on top it actually soaks down in and evenly dampens uh, the substrate for me and then I have a little bit of sphagnum moss up there they like to chew on I keep it damp they can hide under it and I just gave them a piece of carrot as well. So last thing I have, we actually got to come over here. I'm a bit of a mess. Um, so this here is the last thing I got. You can kind of see your brown kind of circle under the leaf back there. This is a crossweb orb weaver. And I believe it's a juvenile female because the males are a the adult males are about the size of this one now, um, but I don't see any of the pedipalps, which look like boxing gloves. So I think it's a juvenile female, just based on size. Um, this is kind of the cage. This is about a one gallon, one to one and a half gallon size uh, tub that used to have little candy canes in it. And this is like a vine. I got plants along the back, some of the plastic canvas glued. There is a strip of paper um, glued to the top, all kinds of branches. I need to add a few more things, um, but plenty of anchoring points. I didn't know uh, how big it was going to be when I got it, so it took longer to set this up than it would be for me to upgrade. So, toss it in here for now. We're gonna, I'm going to wait a couple of days, see how she does. Apparently, this species will actually like grab insects just so if they get tangled in just like a trip wire so I guess apparently they don't need a full web in order to eat um, but any of the trip lines which you can't see but I saw her laying them when I put her in here they're just single line threads that they use to anchor themselves as they're crawling and I guess apparently if an insect gets caught in one of those this species is known to still eat it. They're considered one of the easier species to keep in captivity. But there is still a lot of uh, experimentation on how you do caging. So I do have a bigger cage that I can upgrade her to. I'm just going to give her a few days, kind of see how she does to settle in. Um, but she has a little webbing under that that leaf there and she was checking out this vine I kind of left the vine unobstructed so she could use the vine as a web um, frame and build a web across basically that entire thing or you know she could anchor to there and to this and here and build it across the diagonal which is why I only have this stuff um, placed along the sides and I have the center of the cage open so that there's that big open space for her, her to build a big round web because they're an orb weaver. That is what they do. Um, so it's going to be a lot of experiment with the cage. I'm probably going to order an all fabric cage now that I see that the one I received in the mail is big enough to not escape from the actual insect uh, fabric cages. 
and I think honestly the fabric cages the like the neck cages are going to be the best for any orb weaver really because the sides are completely climbable and then you put a couple of twigs in there and they can a lot easier just kind of anchor you know wall wall and climb everything um at one point she was stuck here in the corner that i put her on the plant she crawled over was on the the plastic canvas here and then couldn't figure out how to get here because she had to go down to the floor and crawl over so it's not perfect it's going to be highly experimental and touch and go but it's just what i was able to throw together i'm going to go to this side and see if we can't get a better look at her for you that's that little black brown dot you can kind of see her i guess not very well see her leg <laughs> it's just kind of like the lighting in this room is not very good and I'm not really going to be able to get you a better view, I don't think, of her. There you go. It's probably about as good as we're getting. And you can just feed them any kind of insects that, you know, you can get thrown in their web, basically. So, the mantids are eating. Um, I gave them each a buffalo worm. One of the smaller buffalo worms. Um, the big one was eaten full-size buffalo worm and obviously my little shield mantis is eating like the tiniest like newly hatched baby buffalo worms they took them no problem eating great you saw the bull jumper ate um i'm gonna try and give this girl a red runner um because the red runner will just roll around climb up everything and probably should eventually land in one of her trip wires that are um or anchoring wires across here so so, like I said, this is not by any means very in-depth care info. This is just how I do it, how I have them set up currently. If you have questions about setup or care, I'll try to answer you. If you have any kind of pointers on the the orb weaver, the, the crossweb orb weaver, I would absolutely love to hear it. Um, Peter doesn't really house these. He just gathers them on an as-need basis, so he doesn't really have a care sheet for them. And the only thing I could find as far as orb weavers in captivity is a lot of touch and go. <laughs> Big as you could go, a lot of anchoring points, and you just kind of experiment until you get a situation where they actually web or eat or whatever. So if you've kept these guys before or similar sized orb weavers, drop me some tips. That would be great. There's not a lot of info out there. This is just how I set it up based on what I could find. Um, the total cost for my entire order with the shipping was like $109 for everything. That was just the insects. That was also the express shipping, heat pack. They were like triple packaged, which is awesome. And they're just very packed well. If you haven't seen any of my other... Um, videos of me actually unboxing insects from bugs in cyberspace before go ahead go over to my channel to my videos and check out one of those peter does a very great job at packing everything in little deli cups and um the spiders had lots of um paper towel with them so that they didn't get banged into walls or anything and they get a bust abdomen uh, if they were handled roughly in the mail um, you know, just like any spider should be packaged very good. The millipedes paper towels were still damp when they arrived. And, um, she had a couple of pieces of, uh, leaf litter in there to eat. Just really good packaging. Um, usually the beetles come with a little piece of carrot in there. They didn't this time, but there was some poop in the container. So I'm guessing... They just ate all their food in transit, to be honest. And, uh, you know, the mantids have something to cling on to in their cups. Like, honestly, I've, I've never had a DOA from Bugs in Cyberspace. Ever. So, um, I guess that's it. We're all ramble on forever. <laughs>